So, hello, I'm Victor. I'm a senior here at Shanghai School International Division, and for the last three years, I've dedicated my time to solving a problem in physics that then was widely considered to be impossible. Now, today, I'd like to share some of the steps I took and some of the experiences I gained along the way. Now, my problem is long-range wireless electricity. Now, this means getting electric energy from one terminal to the other without using a wire in the middle. Now, in the short range, it looks something like this, right? Very familiar, very sci-fi. Electrons arc across a very elegant streak. But the point here is to get it to work on a long range, where it can do anything from powering remote desert islands to harvesting energy from space. Now, if this sounds like science fiction, it's because for the longest time it was. And um, I started my project in the ninth grade, and over the last three months. I started the process of publishing my first solutions to the problem. Now, getting to the steps. Step one, be curious, endlessly. Now, research to me is about finding out things that we don't know and improving our knowledge on things we do know. And that comes from asking too many questions. And also, you have to be curious because research is a very long and grueling process. And the urge to know, to find out, is going to motivate you through it better than anything else. Now, step two is to find a problem that fascinates you. As you find a problem, it's because I think that not one person can master an entire field, say physics, chemistry, or biology, or something else. And many great scientists in the past have started their careers from solving a single problem. The great American biologist Michael Brown invented the statin drug that helps millions of people a day with heart attacks. By, by beginning, we're trying to cure a little girl of an obscure genetic disease called familial hypercholesterolemia. The great Italian physicist Enrico Fermi helped invent modern nuclear energy technology by studying a very simple physics process known as beta decay. Now, I started my efforts because this thing, <laughs> right? Because you know, when you're sitting on your bed and binge watching TV shows, and this thing pops out and Microsoft's telling you no more Game of Thrones for you. You're thinking to yourself, gee, wouldn't it be nice if I don't have to walk across the cold room, plug in my charger, and come back, and instead just have it wirelessly powered? I'm, of course, kidding. Okay. So I started my project after I was introduced to a 2007 study done by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology on mid-range wireless energy. And uh, more importantly, I was introduced to the work of this man, Nikola Tesla. This right next to him is his design of the Warden Cliff Tower, which still stands in New York. His final unfinished project. Now he envisioned a world where everything everywhere is powered by global wireless electricity, where every man, woman, and child on the face of the earth can have light and power at night. Now, to me, that was a very beautiful vision, and I had to spend the last three years of my life trying to make it come true. Step three: learn as much about it as possible. I think that building up your knowledge base is very important when constructing solutions because you need to have an extensive knowledge of the field to know what to do. I spent about six months before I started my research learning about every, learning uh, about everything I could find on this topic, reading papers, reading textbooks, and whatnot. And at the end, I thought that I was pretty knowledgeable. And then, as soon as I started research, I came to the realization that I still know nothing. Right? This is going to happen to you at many points <laughs> during your research. Yes. This is this was my expression. This is going to happen to you at many points during your research, but that's that's not a bad thing. It just means you reach a higher threshold, shall we say, of knowledge, and you need to learn more things to continue. That's a good thing. That means you're progressing. So keep learning. Step four: finding institutional support. Now, for me, that was Shanghai Jiao University. Resources and area specialists are very important in helping you through research, especially for us high school students, whose this kind of resource is almost impossible to come by on your own. So this is a picture of me with a oh wait <laughs> uh oh me with uh, someone from Jiao Tong The professor there who helped me a lot. Now next step is finding people to share the adventure with. This is my research partner for a long time, Andrew, who I believe is among the audience today. <laughs> Not only research partner, you need to find friends and family who are willing to support you through this process because research is. 
long and grooming, like I said before. And only when you have very supportive friends, and I don't mean you guys, <laughs> very supportive friends and family members would help you through anything, can you get through it in one piece? Yeah, not you guys. <laughs> okay, so next up is work very, very hard. By which I mean keep learning about it, expanding your knowledge of the field, and thinking about it every day, try to work on it whenever possible. I think that's what it means to be dedicated to a problem, that you can't take your mind off of it even when you're supposed to be doing your math homework. Right. So this is why I say that you have to be very curious about the problem, endlessly curious about the problem that you're working on, or else this turns to a very, very tedious process. You have to be curious, or else there's no way you can force yourself to this process. Now, the problem that we have to defeat was illustr is illustrated here. So this is what happens when you try to transmit energy through air. No matter how concentrated initially it is, it spreads out over any sort of distance. So we try to attack this problem by increasing the intensity of the initial beam and limiting the angle of transmission. Very unfortunately, this led us to step seven. And a black screen. All right. So that's the, ah, here we go. Fail again and again. This is a very natural, trial and error is a very natural, yeah, read the meaning first. Trial and error is a very natural part of research, but also is something that's basically inevitable. Right, and this is going to be very hard. I remember when I first found out that my first model was uh, invalid, I lost eight months of work, right, scratch. And I was very depressed, right? I couldn't work on it for another two months or so. And this is why you need friends and family who support you, right? Because it's very hard to go through this by yourself. Which brings me to step eight, which is taking yourself back. For me, that was about finding the motivation to again to get started. Now, I did this in perhaps but not working out, not you know, finding a religion. I did this in the, the most nerdiest way possible. I read a book. <laughs> right. So this says the inventions, researches, and writings of Nikola Tesla. Now this is a, bio a biography of the man. And in it I read that Tesla, this genius, this legend, right, not great among scientists, but he messed up a lot. Right. But for all of his inventions, all of which seem so magical and elegant, oh my god, Tesla must have just come up with this spot, this stuff on the spot. No, he failed at least two or three times before each invention, right? And so I realized that um, <clears throat> trial and error is not something you can avoid, that failing is not personal. Everybody has to go through this. That's how you find the right thing by doing all the wrong things first. Now, after this, I found a motivation to get going again because I realized that the previous soul-crushing failure, and I cannot stress this enough, this will be very frustrating, the soul-crushing failure before was simply a stepping stone to later progress. Now, oh, oh. Now, step nine is try, try, and try again. Right. So this is going to be the longest part of your research process. I kept studying in the field, I returned to learning fundamental physics, quantum electrodynamics, all of that. You try to increase my knowledge of the field and keep constructing new solutions. I remember I went through six to seven incorrect models, each of which took one to two months of work before I reached the correct one. And you will keep failing. But that's very much okay. That is, in fact, very much inevitable because each wrong step you take will take you, will take you closer to the correct solution. And you repeat this process again and again until you get, you, and it will get you closer and closer to the correct answer. Now, I have to mention here, step 10 is be responsible for your own work. That means for us science students, safety, please don't blow yourself up in your lab, which I very nearly did. I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> right. Safety of yourself and of others. You need to be responsible for your own actions, right? This is not just safety of physically, but also, you know, don't insult other people and whatnot, right? And there are regulations to be respected, no matter if it's of the institution you work with, or the laws of your nation, or international laws, respect them. Now, don't commit treason. I will explain, I will explain. Don't arrest me just yet, okay. When I was constructing an experiment to confirm my hypothesis, 
I realized that one of the equipments, the receiver, was only able to be purchased in the United States in a company called Keysight. And I was, you know, very excited. I found this. So I tried to buy it. And then my professor came running to me and said, Victor, you're about to commit military treason against the United States. <laughs> because I'm a US citizen and I'm in China, so I can't do that. So be very careful of these things. Nobody's going to warn you before it happens. Right. <laughs> and this will bring you to step 11, which is Eureka. I did it. Right. So how we solved the problem was through a quantum electrical process, a quantum process called uh, simulated emission. Now this is what makes lasers work, right? So what happens is that, if you guys can see, this curvy arrow here represents what is called a photon, which is the smallest unit of electromagnetic energy. When it strikes an electron, the electron goes into an elevated state of energy. When another photon passes by, the electron comes back down and releases the previous photon in a parallel direction. So this works on lasers on very small scales to keep the light bouncing back and forth. But imagine, if you will, if you amplify this to the big scale, so every single little packet of energy in the beam that you're transmitting would go in the same direction forever, so it wouldn't spread. Remember, that was the problem. And to do that, we had to develop a microwave laser that was capable of emitting this in parallel directions to begin with. After that, we mathematically modeled the interaction of oxygen with microwaves, and using that, I know it's very important. <laughs> using that, we calculated the amount of energy required. Now, using this, that was, that was a complete solution, right? Because we went out with the paper and everything. We were very happy, but don't get happy just yet when you reach this state, right? Because you need to check your work, check it again, check it a third time, and then you can celebrate. Oh. <laughs> and then you can celebrate. Okay. Right, because when you succeed, there's often a very false sense of lucidity, like, oh my god, I know how this works now. No, you need to make sure you didn't mess up along the way, right? And then, you know, be happy. <laughs> right. right, so I learned something, this I, I feel like I should bring up at this point, that the Eureka moment is not like they make it out to be in the movies. For me, it was sitting at a cafe with a friend, very late in the night, I was very frustrated because I hadn't gotten uh, a lot of progress over the last six months with my research, and I asked him in just a, a fit of nerd rage, how do you keep a stream of bosons unscattered in air? I mean, this guy had no idea what I was saying, right? So you were playing with a very sarcastic, use long wavelengths, which very ironically turned out to be exactly what the solution was. <laughs> so it's not like John Nash, you know, sitting in his bedroom, all writing as the seasons go along, and you know, establish the foundation of modern economics, no. Physics is, and I think um, a lot of scientific research is very serendipitous in this way. And it's kind of quiet, but you know, your biggest leaps often come from places that you least expect it to. And then next is hope that it works. <laughs> yes. Very depressing. Hope that it works. Not note that it works, hope that it works. Right. There's always an uncertainty in doing discovery, doing inventions, because by the very nature of it, you're doing something new, and you don't know what's going to happen. And that's a risk you have to take. For me, I'm going to experimentally confirm my hypothesis in a matter of months. And I've worked on this for three years, but it might show that my theory works well, in which case, hallelujah, we'll be, you know, not getting off our best to charge our laptops and harvesting energy from space soon. It might work poorly, in which case, I might have to spend another decade working on this before it turns out fine. Or it, not work at, or it might not work at all which is going to be very disappointing. But that's a risk we have to take when doing discovery physics or when doing discoveries of any kind. You have to believe that it will work, or else there's no going through it. If you don't start going into that uncertainty, if you don't take that risk, no progress is going to happen. You have to believe that once I step on this very long, very hard journey, something is waiting for me at the other end. Right. In other words, you have to be daring. And Benjamin Franklin said, energy and persistence conquers all. Everything is impossible before someone daring enough says, maybe it's not. And it will always be unfinished until someone with the energy and persistence necessary sees it through. And so, okay. <laughs> I'm not a genius. I was never a child prodigy. I was not born to parents that are physicists. 
I'm not the head of some government agency, right? I'm not a you know physics prodigy or any of that. It's not, and I feel through these years of research, I realized that it's when it comes down to it, it's not about that. That's not what matters the most. It's about being daring, being energetic, and being persistent through ups and downs, hard times and easy ones. So I think that risk is worth taking. So for every kid that wakes up tomorrow morning and says, I would like to do something impossible today, I say, good luck. You must pull it off. Thank you.